Dear all, hello. Welcome to Anamet Library Talk. Our talks continue in 2023, and this is the first talk of the year. At today's talks, we have three distinguished speakers with us. Christina Filio, Firuzan Miliki Sumertaş, and Halis Teodelilis, Teodelilis Rigas. Today's talk is enti entitled Hiding in Plain Sight, the Istanbul Collaborative, Reconstruction in Greek Community of 19th 19th and early 20th century Istanbul. In this talk, the speakers will speak about how the collaborative came to be, the scholar scholarly questions they are addressing, the need for such a project both for so scholarly and public domains, and the digital humanities methodologies we are developing to realize the project. They founded the Istanbul Collaborative in two two 2020 to serve as an online hub for studies on the spatial, physical, and demographic aspects of the Rum Greek Orthodox presence in Istanbul between 1821 and 19 to 1923, and have been developing a range of digital humanities projects that link up to it. They will also discuss the range of archival sources they have been using and the ways they have been discussing and processing those sources together. At this point, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Christine, Christine Filio is a professor in history department and director of the programs in Ottoman, Turkish and modern Greek studies there at UC Berkeley, both of which she recently founded. Her works include Biography of an Empire, Governing Ottomans in an Age of Revolution and Turkey, a Past Against History and articles in journals such as Comparative Studies in Society and History, Comparative Studies in South Asia, Africa and the Middle East, and New Perspective on Turkey. She is currently working on a range of projects that connect, connect to the Istanbul Collaborative and teaches courses on the Middle East, Balkans and Eastern Mediterranean, as well as Comparative Empires. Firuzan Meliki Sumertaş is currently a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley and assistant prof professor at Istanbul Kent University. Her research focuses on the urban architectural visual culture of the late Ottoman Empire and is capital with a particular interest in the Greek Orthodox community of Istanbul. She holds a PhD in history from Boziç University and an MArc degree from Middle East Technical University. Her current project at UC Berkeley under the umbrella of Istanbulist collaboration focuses on utilizing digital humanities tools for urban architectural historical research. The moderator of this talk is Halis Theodoridis Rigas, is lecturer in classical Greek and Latin in the archaeology department of Koch University. With a background in classics, development studies and political science. He is also co-founder and series editor of Istos Yayin, Turkey's first publishing house that specializes in Anatolian Greek literature, history, and culture. His research interests include classical and Byzantine reception, as well as minority and liminal groups and their cultural heritage in post-Ottoman geographies. Dear attendees, please be reminded your video and audios are closed. Please type your question in the chat section. Your questions will be answered in Q&A section. Now I'm passing the word to Haris Rigas. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and to be introducing this uh, really exciting uh, project. Uh, I understand that this is actually its uh, debut. It's the first time that the project is uh, formally presented to the public, so uh, double the honor and the joy for uh, for me. Uh, I want to start by uh, getting a bit uh, emotional and nostalgic, and I want to uh, uh, remember basically back those days when I was starting, you know, I was starting to study the rooms in the, let's say, late 2000s, and uh, then the greatly missed uh, friend, uh, teacher and colleague Vagelis Kekriotis one day just handed me this book with a little <laughs> note in Greek saying, Diavaseto, read it. <laughs> and of course, that book was the biography of an empire. And the reason why I'm, I'm mentioning this is not just to be nostalgic and emotional, but it's because I think that book uh, 
really captured the spirit of an age. And I'm not talking about 19th century Ottoman Empire. I'm talking about the age I was being a PhD student at the time. So uh, as an introduction, I want to, in effect, talk a bit about the book, but not so much about the book as a much as uh, about the sort of methodological strands, the hints that it gave to many PhD students that actually run through this project as well, in my view. Uh, the first thing I learned from that book was that microhistory is something of a misnomer. <laughs> Uh, it's not that micro at all. I mean, you can. Uh, there's so much to be, uh, you know, achieved by looking at one specific family, and there's so much that that can tell you about the sort of eagle-eye view of the larger picture. Uh, oftentimes, much more than you know, old serious history, as some people call it, of events and diplomatic uh, uh, clashes and wars, etc. Uh, the second thing I learned from that book was that. Um, there's so much to be achieved in both Ottoman and modern Greek studies by abandoning a kind of methodological nationalism. And by which I mean, of course, I, I think I should unpack this. Uh, the first thing I mean, of course, is the uh, emphasis, the voicing, the um, paying attention to groups that have been formerly neglected or excluded from uh, official national narratives and uh, historiographies. And the rooms, of course, are a case in point. I mean, now it might appear very obvious to us. Back then, it wasn't that obvious at all uh, that, you know, you can't possibly claim to be understanding Ottoman Istanbul and simply disregarding the sources, newspapers, professions, uh, intellectual activity of one third of its population, right? Um, the second part of what I call, what people call methodological nationalism, that I think uh, is... Uh, uh, what projects like this are actually uh, working against in many ways is, uh, uh, I mean, the obvious point that we all tend to work with languages that we feel comfortable with. And, you know, learning languages, especially ancient languages, I know this from my professional experience, <laughs> is a heartless job. Uh, it's an ungrateful job. It puts a lot of, you know, it requires a lot of energy. Uh, but I think part of the heritage of that period, the 2000s, and what was happening in the Greek and Turkey, Turkish academia at the time, was precisely this insistence on people trying to learn the languages that are not, uh, you know, nationally inclined to, right? And uh, I think it's, uh, it's fantastic uh, good news that uh, an increasing number of people in Greece start learning Ottoman and uh, students in Turkey start learning Greek, not to mention Katharevsa Greek, like Melike here, who's a, who's a star uh, of a Greek speaker. Um, I think even if people never manage to absolutely master that, you know, dreaded Ottoman or Katharevsa Greek, the other point that abandoning methodological nationalism uh, makes is that we should at least collaborate. Even if our understanding of that language is weak, we should definitely try to meet with people who will sort of complement uh, our weaknesses and you know this uh, sort of exchange of uh, know-how and basically working together. And in that sense, I think the Istanbul is collaborative is very important simply by being an international collaborative, right? The, the collaborative part, I think, I find very relevant. Uh, looking back at those times and to today's times, I think there's a series of unfortunate events has caused us to uh, witness a bit of a regression in some aspects. So there are much fewer uh, visiting uh, faculty in the two countries. There are much fewer uh, Greek academics working in Turkey and vice versa. Um, there are much fewer uh, exchange students. And uh, I think this was the blood and uh, sort of uh, muscle behind this uh, uh, change of paradigm, I think, in uh, Ottoman and modern Greek studies that occurred back then. Uh, however, on the positive side, as I said, uh, there's a big number of students that grew out of that uh, school. And uh, like me and Melike actually invested uh, time and money into precisely doing uh, learning languages and uh, trying to deal with primary sources uh, so uh, beyond their comfort zones. Another positive development I think that is relevant to this project is of course the, uh, yes, maybe physical mobility is a bit uh, smaller, but digital mobility is uh, has been rather enhanced in the meantime. 
and uh, the digital humanities and uh, long distance collaborations and alternative publishing tools have uh, really increased. And I think that's one of the strongest uh, aspect of this project, which I still cannot believe hasn't been funded. I can't believe, I mean, Christine will, will, will tell us all about it, but I still can't fathom that this is the result, what, what she's going to, what the, she and Melike are going to present to us today is the result of uh, voluntary, uh, a lot of voluntary work and collaborations. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to take more time from the speakers. I think now is a good time for, uh, uh, I, I believe Christine will start uh, by uh, explaining the um, platform, the project to us, at least at the, the very early stages. And then uh, Melike would uh, uh, also explain some particular projects that form part of it. Thank you both for coming. Thank you so much, Haris, for that generous, very generous introduction. And I have to say, it makes all the difference to have a moderator who understands the project and where it's coming from, not just someone who's keeping time. So this is wonderful to have a, a third interlocutor here. Um, it's really exciting and it's a pleasure for us to be here. And, and I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to, we've, we've really had to take stock of all that we've done in the last two years in order to prepare for this. And it's been, it's been really productive for us just in the framework of the project too. Um, and we're looking forward to getting feedback from you and from the, the, the um, audience members. Um, so I thought we would just start by explaining how the project came to be. Um, <laughs> and it's a COVID story. <laughs> uh, it was almost exactly two years ago, actually. So lockdown and I was on sabbatical and unable to leave the house, needless to say, unable to travel to Greece or Turkey uh, to do research for a next project. And um, my heart was in Istanbul, as it always has been. And I think that goes for a lot of most of the people on this collaborative. And we were unable to travel there. And so this kind of grew out of this need to connect back to Istanbul um, under COVID circumstances. At the same time um, at Berkeley, I was working to establish two separate but integrated programs. The one in modern Greek slash Hellenic studies and one in Ottoman Turkish studies. And the, the vision or the guiding question for this venture was, um, what happens when we really integrate Ottoman and Greek sources, questions and methods? So along the lines of what Hardis was saying, what kinds of <clears throat> insights come out when we truly connect the two and see one through the lens of the other? Um, these are post-nationalist questions. Um, and I think that they, they go beyond nationalism to humanism. So I really, this is truly a humanities project, right? It's a humanist humanities project. We are starting from the assumption that everyone we're studying were full human beings, whether they were minorities, whether they were Christian or Muslim or Jewish, they were full human beings and they had layers and layers of different connections and affiliations that we would like to understand from their perspectives. Um, so Istanbulis became kind of the showcase for this larger project of these two interrelated and integrated programs of modern Greek, Hellenic, and Ottoman Turkish. Um, kind of a proof of concept of this humanist venture, right? Um, and I think the spirit of the project really is encapsulated in the name of this, this made up word, Istanbulis, that doesn't necessarily roll off the tongue for everyone in all languages, but I think it does, uh, I, I insist on it because it does kind of force us to think outside of <laughs> the traditional terminology that we have, even for this city that we know so well and love, right? Um, and what does it mean? It's basically, just to unpack the meaning of this one word, it is the room, let's call it polis, right? Embedded or enmeshed in the Ottoman and Turkish Istanbul, which was itself built on and named after Byzantine Constantinople. So we have this kind of double layering going on um, in the meaning of the word, and then obviously in the history that we're trying to explore. Um, and rather than cleave, like, as we all know, right, when we study Istanbul or, or many places in the Ottoman Empire, right, the 
impulse, even if we're not, we don't consider ourselves nationalists, the impulse is to kind of cleave the histories from each other, right? And um, this resists that and tries to take up the scale of urban space, right? Um, adding back in this group, as Hardy's pointed out, this group who often made up up to one third of the city's population, but whose presence and history has been all but erased, certainly from public awareness, if not scholarly inquiry. Um, and it is, it's pretty striking actually, when you think about all of the material vestiges um, in the city and the level of just zero or simplistic awareness of what those buildings meant in their lifetimes. Um, so as I started to kind of design what I wanted the project to look like, I was inspired by a number of efforts that have been going on in other fields, other sort of subtopics of Ottoman history and beyond. So I thought it's worth mentioning those because then you can kind of see how we put different pieces to get. We drew different pieces from these different projects. Um, there's a lot going on about the Armenian Ottoman past, which has been pretty amazing in the digital realm, such as Husham Adian, which I think is Vahe Tashjian's effort out of Berlin. Um, this incredible website and repository about sort of reconstruction of Armenian life in Ottoman Anatolia. Um, and within that, there was a project on Armenian Ottoman census registers um, where they mapped the, the data from those. And I believe it was Hakan, um, not Hakan Erdem. I, I believe it was Erdem Kabadaya and Daniel Ohanian who were running that. And so that was very inspiring for a big part of the project that we're about to talk about. Um, also Open Jerusalem, which I believe is an ERC, and it's a it's a collaborative project to reconstruct and study 19th century Jerusalem. They've they're going they're sort of coming at it to um, study all the different groups in that city in that period. We are starting just with the room for now, as I said, to kind of build them back in to the larger context. There was also this great project called the Holocaust Geographies Collaborative. Um, and that was interesting, not because of the topic, this is not connected to the Holocaust, but because of the um, digital humanities methods and the collaborative structure that they have. Um, and then Intermusic Project on 19th century um, intercommunal relations about music in Istanbul run by one of our uh, team members, Panayotis Poulos um, out of Athens. And um, finally, there were a lot of, as we started this project, we realized that there were um, other really interesting related projects going on, I think at Marmara University about mapping 19th century mahales. So not room communities, but this same impulse to sort of visualize, spatialize, um, pin down map, this very small neighborhood units. Um, so we, I wondered why, <laughs> How is it possible that there's nothing comfort, comparable for Ottoman Greek history and particularly related to Istanbul? So this was the kind of space or the niche that we wanted to, um, to develop. We also, um, the project is building on um, a huge project, a digitization project that happened in the last, what, I guess, 20 to 10 years, um, the Anthemion project, which was um, run by some Greek colleagues aimed at capturing the wealth of documentation in Greek Orthodox community archives in Istanbul. I think it was from the late 1990s into the 2000s. And that repository is now held or hosted by the National Kapovistian University in Athens. So that, um, so the logic was like, well, look, there's all this data even sitting right there. In addition to all of these Ottoman sources we're gonna talk about. So let's, launch a new project to make use of that and facilitate the production of knowledge from it and to do that in a way that would be publicly accessible. So those are like the big ambitions of the project. Um, now the website is obviously a key part of the project and that is, um, that's because we had, we wanted this to be a hub, but we want it to be a place to display the projects that we have been doing and a hub for displaying and connecting other projects because there are smaller projects that are underway relevant to um, these Greek room, we can talk about the terminology too, but Greek room communities in 19th century Istanbul. Um, and as Hari's pointed out, we, or I think Yudam also mentioned, so 1821 to 1923 is worth um, 
spelling out the period after the outbreak of the Greek Revolution, all the way until the Treaty of Lausanne. We end there, a lot of projects begin there, and um, there are a lot of sort of ethnographies or sort of oral histories happening with um, Rome that are still alive in Istanbul and out of Istanbul. Um, but we end it there because obviously the political and the legal regime under which the Istanbul room were living changed significantly. So we wanted to just bookend this 19th century as a period when the Greek community was still flourishing or was flourishing and was caught in the increasing tension between belonging to the empire and or to the Greek nation state. And so we don't address those tensions directly, but through the kinds of demographic and spatial studies, we can see indirectly those larger political changes. So again, the spirit of micro history <laughs> taken to a larger scale in a sense, a more ambitious scale. Um, okay, so in terms of the digital humanities projects that feed into this website that we are doing, um, these the, the emphasis is on um, data analysis, visualization, spatializing our knowledge based on the data sets that we are calling, we are reading Ottoman and Greek language archival records, and we are creating data sets, often mostly in the form of spreadsheets. And then we are developing mechanisms, software, whatever, to, um, to bring those to the website in the form of maps and statistical analysis and other kinds of commentary about the data. The main question here, and this is, I think, what, um, what differentiates this from just, I don't know, other kinds of studies, is um, what were the sub-communities of room in Istanbul? So we're not just looking at the millet to some imagined or real monolith, right, which is often talked about like that, or even the room community of the city as a monolith. We're going down several levels, right? We want to understand the neighborhoods, the parish communities of each of the churches, the kinotites or the communities on the administrative level that sometimes were one parish and sometimes were a few parishes put together, the schools as they, as they unfolded in the 19th century, family networks, communities of people in Istanbul from the same place of origin outside of Istanbul, professional communities. And then as um, Melike can talk much more about the kind of uh, professional associations and scholarly associations that happened later in the 19th century. So we're looking at that level of connection and affiliation community. And, you know, as we look at our data, we're also, we also have in mind the questions about when and where these were intracommunal, right? And um, how they were connected to those of other confessional communities, regional communities, et cetera. So we're really trying to cut in with as many lines as we can to understand the different, um, really the cosmology of these people through their positioning, their location, their migration, and the demographic trends that we can take, uh, that we can trace. So, um, Again, I think, as I said earlier, these are questions that taken together work to humanize the members of these communities instead of just labeling them a member of the room community and then moving on. Um, and we've already made some really interesting <laughs> insights, just even on the basis of the data that we've explored so far about movement. And, you know, we, we I think that there's, a, it's easy to assume that the room community of Istanbul is some kind of static um, entity that <laughs> does not change over time, but only, of course, decreased uh, after 23. It's actually a very dynamic uh, group that's constantly changing. People are constantly coming in from other areas. They're constantly moving out. Um, it's not at all what I might have thought it was when I started this. So that has already been very productive. Um, now, um, we have a special dossier about to come out in Jotza in the Journal of Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. And I, in the introduction to that, I make some of the points that I'm making now. And I just think it's worth pointing out once again that, as Hardy did, that, these, the, you, that the experience of these communities as part of this larger Istanbul community of Rum is unique 
in the context of both Greek and Turkish kind of national experiences. And it has been erased in both, I would say, Greek and Turkish national history for different reasons, right? For Turkish national history, I think we don't even need to spell that out. It's quite obvious, although if Hardy would like to, if Hardy would like to, we could talk about it more in the discussion. But in Greek national history, you'd think that it would not be the case because Istanbul, Constantinople was such an important part of Greek policy and sort of Greek identity in the 19th and early and 20th centuries, that the whole point was the Magali Idea was to take back Constantinople. And yet, possibly because of the failure of that, um, the unique experience of the community that actually lived there was not really valued. It, they were kind of just written off um, and certainly written off after 23 for various political reasons in Greece. So. Um, it's really quite eye-opening to use this as the lens, to have this be the focus and to understand what history might have looked like from the perspective of people living in this city uh, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So this is why, you know, this is why I found the title Hiding in Plain Sight, because <laughs> I think it really does also, in addition to the word Istanbul, it encapsulates the predicament of, of this history and these experiences, right? We see all the buildings, we see the churches, we walk through the city today, and yet where is the understanding, where is the empathy actually? <laughs> Not just the understanding that people existed that built these things and inhabited these places, but that these were people just like us, right? That had all kinds, that imperfect people, let's put it that way, but fully human people. Um, now we had wanted to, I think I've kind of already addressed why um, why this is needed and how it's different from, um, from national approaches. And, oh yes, that's what I wanted to do is to add, I think that a logical question for someone seeing this before them is, well, why aren't you just reinforcing nationalist divisions by singling out the room community for this study? Why don't you do what Open Jerusalem does and look at all the different groups of the city because it's all about how they connect it. Yes, ultimately that is the goal, but we I see this as kind of a corrective project, right? <laughs> the first step is to correct the absence and the erasure, right? And then the next step, and I hope that people will do this with us and after us, is to use this knowledge to then correct, revise what people thought they knew about Istanbul's history, right? I can give examples. Some of the very deaf stars, some of the very census registers we're working with, have been used by um, by Turkish scholars. They've been they've become PhD theses or whatever, and so they they transliterate the whole thing. They do the statistics, um, and they completely <laughs> anonymize. It does not matter to them that the names of all of these non-Muslims are there. They just say, okay, there were this many non-Muslims, but that's not the point of the project. The point of the project is to look at the guilds or the Hans or whatever, and so it's really just Unconsciously, I'm sure, but it's just marginalized systematically. Um, and that is pretty remarkable because you have the actual names of people and the places where they're from, oftentimes the year of birth. And to just relegate that to unimportant detail is, is fascinating and very telling, I think. Um, are we arguing for coexistence or tolerance then as we're writing these people back in whenever? No, we're not. <laughs> I think I hope I pointed that out in my first book, but that's not that's not the uh, the full picture at all. And I think it is it kind of distorts the history and the experience by using those concepts um, as sine qua nons. Um, we are, I think, trying to apply the gaze of sort of ethnographers, data collectors, social scientists, right? well aware of the power dynamics in which the room were implicated. And I mean that not just in terms of where, they fit and didn't fit in the realm of imperial governance, urban administration, also the politics of the Greek church, right? Um, which um, divided them into parishes and kinotites and which we could have endless discussions about the internal conflicts of that. So we are trying to unpack all of those things as much as we can. Um, a couple other points about the design, the sort of um, logistical organizational design of the project. Community involvement and engagement has been a priority from the beginning. And we tried very hard 
um, and I think this is unique to the project. It is a scholarly project, and <laughs> we are we have actively solicited the advice, the support, and the continuing involvement of the leaders of the room community, of what's left of the room community in Istanbul, and of course, those who have gone abroad, which are many more than are left in the city now, um, in the diaspora today, including Patriarch Bartholomew himself, who's supportive of the project. And we had uh, extensive meetings with um, various leaders of the community, um, not just because we see the community archives as being a really important dimension of this, but because we value the lived experience. Granted, it is different from the 19th century, but we think it's important to stay connected to the actual community whose history we are tracing. Um, and we call it a collaborative for a reason. <laughs> um, it, my hope was to create a new kind of community that would be studying the questions of community in the past, right? This community is people, as Hardy said, people interested in the intersection of Ottoman and Greek studies um, as these studies play out in the urban space. And as you can see here, we have several tiers of association with the project. We have core members who already, I mean, the whole reason I invited them um, to be part of this is because they've already done um, and continue to do important work in their own right on related topics, right? Um, on either the, the fabric of the city, on the Greek communities of the city. Um, many of them know both languages um, and they are kind of living proof of this trend that Hardis was talking about from God, 10, 10 years ago, 20 years, God. It will come again and we're gonna try to make that happen now. Um, so we have the kind of core group and we were doing monthly meetings for quite a while. And then, you know, as lockdown ended, people's lives resumed and their commitments resumed. So some of us continue working intensely on it. Others are kind of involved in one or another project and others are doing their own projects that, but that are related, whether they, whether they like it or not, right? They're related to what we've been talking about. And there've been a lot of kind of publications and workshops and things that have already grown out of this almost unintentionally. Um, and then we have um, we have our IT team, obviously, which has been an interesting challenge to try to like <laughs> um, translate what we're trying to do to people who know the technology but don't necessarily know the content of what we're doing. And that's been great. Um, and then we have um, volunteers. We have student volunteers in the context of formal programs at Berkeley that facilitate this. So there's discovery program that is for data science students to kind of um, apprentice on projects like this. There's a undergraduate research apprenticeship program. We have students generating some texts for us. And then we have people, special, very special people who have approached us out of the blue um, through our email on our website um, or have just emailed me and undergrads and grad students in um, various countries who wanted to just be part of this. And that has been truly inspiring, I have to say. Um, so I'd like to thank them um, here. And we have um, internet, we have institutional sponsors, mainly Berkeley at this point. <laughs> Um, and we have affiliate partners and institutional partners that, again, either members of our team are connected to these institutions or we've done um, formal agreements to share resources and um, and collaborate. So, you know, we really do see this as a collaborative and beyond that as the hub of a larger network that we can draw on uh, as the project evolves. Um, now, to kind of transition into telling you about the specific kinds of projects that we're doing. Uh, I think the best way to explain it is under two or three larger umbrellas. Um, the big one, I would say that the meat and potatoes of what we've been doing is the project for these Ottoman census registers, specifically about the room. Often, for the earlier period, incidentally mentioning Jews and Armenians, which is fascinating and which we are tracking and um, and doing visualizations for, but in general um, about the room. And this helps us, I mean, I guess the other thing that maybe is obvious when you stop to think about it, but we hadn't stopped to think about it until we did this, is that um, 
the nature of the sources um, and volume of the sources is really different pre and post 1860. So the way that we're dealing with that, because we're covering 1821 to 1923, is that the 1821 to 1860 roughly period is really covered by these Ottoman census registers. Now these go neighborhood by neighborhood. They're not fully consistent. Sometimes they mention the parish. So they mention the church parishes. Sometimes it'll be professional um, categories. Sometimes it'll, it's different kinds of things, but named people. So we have names, often professions, places of origin, um, age, all kinds of other information that gets in there. Um, and so this we see as we're really trying to um, not quantify, but really granularly reconstruct the inhabitants, these anonymous inhabitants, right, before 1860. Um, post-1860, it's really a whole different world, and Melike can tell us more about that with the projects there. Tons more Greek sources for that. Tons more, um, well, there emerges a class of kind of, of notoriety, of notables, of sort of um, prominent professionals and, and even bigger figures. And so for that, we wanted to create a who's who, basically a relational database, a kind of who's who of the community post-1860, keeping in mind and with an eye to the, the spatial uh, connections, behaviors, whatever, spatial positioning of these people, um, the schools they went to, the places they worked, where they lived, whether they moved, all of those things. Um, so there's the census, the Ottoman census registers, then a slew of Greek sources that helps us kind of put together this who's who almost prosopography database post 1860. And then there are these projects that we'd like to feature on the website that are these kind of public engagement projects. And um, one of those is um, what we started with our student volunteers here at Berkeley. And it's these little profiles of the constituent kinotites or neighborhood um, that the room lived in. So Again, Melike has worked with them more closely so she can explain more. So there's that. And then there are some students that had approached us that wanted to make a documentary about a particular house that they lived in, in Tarlabasha. So um, we're kind of trying to encourage and sponsor um, younger people to do smaller scale projects. So those are the three kind of big rubrics um, that, are, that our own Istanbul police projects um, are composed of. And then if you wanna move on, I can talk about the um, the Death Stars, yes. <laughs> so um, we have created a, a sub-community of people working on these. Uh, we have this Death Star reading group and we try to meet monthly. We do work on our own in between. And we are reading these Ottoman census registers of room inhabitants of Istanbul. Um, each clump, for those of you who don't know Ottoman, each clump is one person. Um, and this is, anyway, this is an interesting one because this is the one that mixes the, the room and the Armenians and Jews. Uh, and this is organized by Han. Um, as I said, other ones later are organized by other kinds of categories, um, which we can talk about. So we read these um, and we, convert the information into data on a spreadsheet. Well, this was one, this was one way we did it um, for one of, because some of the earlier deaf stars, again, the Ottomanists will not be surprised about this. Some of the earlier deaf stars were not very consistent in the way that they were um, set up. And so you'd get different kinds of information in each entry. So it was very hard to create a spreadsheet for that. And we were early on in our kind of methods. And so we, figured the easiest is just to transliterate the whole thing and just, you know, capture it as identically as possible to what it was in the death deck. Of course, this became a problem because we had to figure out how to convert it to data that the computer would understand, right? So we tried color coding and this is just giving you a little bit of the back end of like the kind of process that we've been in to develop methods to take this very unwieldy data and put it into some kind of form that the the computer would understand to create visualizations. This is a more typical um, 
spreadsheet that we were able to generate from some of the later DEFTAR. So this is based on a church, Ayo Dimitri Tartatavla, right? So um, Ayo Dimitri Tartatavla, this is like what, late 1830s, early 1840s. And you can see the kinds of information we have. We can think about um, households because you can see like the heads of households, the sons, the brothers, et cetera. Um, profession, place of origin, age, tax status, um, physical description. We're we're still we're recording that. We're not quite sure if that's gonna lead to anything, but we could do a great statistical analysis of like eyebrow color and stuff when we when we get finished with all of this. Um, so um, yeah, so these are what our data sets look like that we then are converting. What are we converting them into, Monique? <laughs> Into, um, into visualizations of into visualizations of political difference. Yes. So yeah. So what we would have loved to do was if we had actual street addresses, we could have like actually plotted out where everybody was. Here we can at least put statistical analyses like in Tatavla at this point in time, people were from the say, you know, and it's interesting to see how it connects up with the kind of local knowledge about those areas. Because if you talk to, to an Istanbul room. An older person, they'll tell you, oh, in Tatabla, they're all this and they're all from there. That could be true, or sometimes it's not totally true for these earlier periods. And that, so we're constantly trying to compare different forms of knowledge, basically, um, about these places and how they developed. Um, and I think with that, I will hand it over to Meli Kay, who will tell us about all of the many other projects. Um, Thank you, uh, Christine, and uh, thank you. Uh, I, I would like to begin also by thanking uh, Anamet actually uh, for the for the invitation. I also I would like to acknowledge the small amount of support that I got from uh, Tibitak for being here at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, that's how I uh, could come, and I would like to also thank Christine for inviting me to this uh, wonderful project. I'm really enjoying and learning a lot from the project. Uh, maybe I should just begin by indicating that where Christine has left, like, uh, what are we doing with these uh, census <laughs> registers? Actually, we are also trying to visualize them. This is one example that we we tried to map actually the information about the certain hunts that pe these people were living or working in, uh, in one of the DEFTARs. So we are trying to uh, engage our information from the, from the census registers or from different uh, sources, which I will uh, shortly mention, uh, into certain visualizations uh, or certain... Uh, domains already which are available for us, like Google Maps or uh, digital technologies, which are uh, already uh, at our uh, use uh, for the time being. But also we are discussing other ways of visual visualizing these and uh, other modes of uh, importing information into these uh, urban uh, contexts. Um, this is again another project that uh, relates to the census registers. Actually, it is the, uh, yeah, it is the Greek uh, Chris, would you like to add something on this or shall I yeah, continue? Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I forgot. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, so this okay. is another one that that, in, that dovetails in interesting ways with the big Ottoman census register um, uh, project that we're doing. And this is um, the register kept by the Greek embassy starting in 1879 in Istanbul of the citizens of Greece resident in Istanbul. So that, I mean, for anyone who knows the history, that's a really interesting subgroup that was growing and that ended up having kind of an impact on things. So this is, um, so now we have all the granular data for those people. We have their actual names, where they're from, their ages, all the family information too, which we don't have in the Ottoman. Like they actually talk about women here, which is amazing. They talk about the name of the spouse, the age, the children, um, the religion. And it's interesting because you'll see some Catholics and some Jews uh, among the Greek citizens living in Istanbul. So again, we were learning who knows, I guess maybe people who are deep in this and, and you know, from the, these areas might sort of know these along general terms, but seeing it spelled out, seeing the details of it, I think is going to lead to a really different level of insight about it. And we can start to put together because it does also tell you what um, neighborhood in Istanbul they're living to. So then we can start to put together how these specific neighborhoods have changed, how Tatavla changes from 18... 30 to 1880, right? And it was changing a lot. So like we can really pin all of this down in a way that um, has been done kind of anecdotally, I think before now. Yeah, thank you, Monique. <laughs> sure. 
Um, so uh, if I would like to, if I uh, continue with the other projects, like under the grand heading of HUSU, uh, I should start, I should begin with mentioning the general uh, or the, the biggest uh, questionnaire that we have developed uh, for, uh, for getting this granular information about slightly more uh, prominent people uh, of uh, the post-1860 uh, uh, in the Greek community of Istanbul and actually the, uh, towards the early 20th century. We have uh, we particularly designed a, a form of questionnaire in English and Greek at the same time, which is, uh, which is in a census register in itself. So we are doing our own census uh, search from people who already uh, have certain knowledge about it or people who has, who has worked on this topic uh, in, uh, in their scholarly research. Um, so we developed this as a uh, Google Form interface to be able to uh, use it as, uh, to be to be able to be used by many different people all over the world who has some information about these people who has lived in Istanbul for uh, late in the late 19th early 20th century and we have uh, we have asked questions where, like any qu single question that you would like to know about one person like uh, their name surname origins professions titles the neighborhood they have lived the time frame they have lived so again, uh, it actually uh, talks to, I mean, it actually resonates back to the questions and points that Christine was outlining earlier, like the, developing a granular data of these prominent individuals. And after uh, gathering all this data, of course, aiming, we were aiming to, uh, we are aiming to uh, the uh, specialize this information that we gather uh, about these prosopographies of these uh, prominent people who has once lived in, uh, in Istanbul uh, in the late, 19th, early 20th century. So we have actually a lot of uh, questions to be able to granul uh, granulize the data that we can drive as specific as we could get uh, in many ways. Of course, uh, another point, another project uh, that Christine mentioned or uh, another institution <laughs> that has to be named actually when we are speaking about the Greek of Istanbul is the, uh, the famous uh, Greek Materia Society, the Eleni Kosilogos, that's an institution that I have also worked in my uh, within my dissertation research, uh, which is a hub, international hub of uh, many uh, Greek prominent intellectuals, as well as uh, people in and out of uh, Istanbul and uh, also from other communities of Istanbul. So um, we are working on the uh, membership lists of uh, this Silogos institution, which was established in 1861 in, uh, in Istanbul and which was active until the um, uh, end of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so, uh, like more than six decades, and we have plenty of uh, journals published by the intellectuals of uh, the society, and which has the uh, which has the names and uh, actually membership lists of uh, all its members throughout uh, its uh, whole intellectual life. So we are working on this uh, journal uh, to gather the data about these members, their, their names, their professions, their origins, actually. To, again, to transform them into uh, some kind of uh, data set that we can, uh, in a way, uh, map the intellectual environment uh, in Istanbul, like how these people are, because this uh, research will also lead to another uh, another step of this research will be the uh, mapping of these uh, pers personalities, like individuals, uh, their participation to the uh, Tilogos discussions and their research and their uh, discussions and their kind of intellectual map uh, is aimed in this project. And uh, as you know, the, among the Silogos members, there are a lot of uh, famous names of also, not only the Greek community of Istanbul, but also uh, the uh, larger Ottoman intellectual community uh, or even a European uh, community. Um, so we are again uh, tr transforming these, this data we have uh, into a spreadsheet form. And then from this uh, moment, we will transform these into visualizations and also uh, we will link them into concepts. Uh, the personalities will be linked to, into certain concepts and certain discussions. And then we, are, uh, we will be visualizing and mapping these as well. I also would like to underline the help uh, and acknowledge the help I'm getting. I'm really getting from, the, our, uh, from our volunteers from, who are participating in this project. So uh, this is uh, a lot of hand labor a lot of uh, work, so they are helping me in this. Uh, I'm grateful to them as well. Uh, another project that I, uh, I would like to mention under this who's who, uh, or let's say the relationship with the urban context and uh, the uh, existence of concepts and uh, individuals into um, 
the perspective of individuals on this urban context uh, within the Greek community is the famous Alexander Paspatis, who, on whom uh, I have been working for a while, uh, also including my uh, PhD dissertation as well. Uh, you know, Alexander Paspatis was uh, one of the um, late, one of the eminent Byzantinists of the late Ottoman Istanbul. And he, in collaboration with the Silogos, which I have uh, recently mentioned, uh, the Greek Literary of so Society of Istanbul, he conducted his uh, famous research on the land walls of Istanbul, and he uh, published it uh, in his book titled Byzantine Studies. However, he has another book, uh, which is as much valuable, but usually less known. Uh, it is the book he had published on the patient records of Bodokla Hospital, where he had served first as a doctor and then as a director uh, between 1840 and 1860. Uh, the book was already, as you see, is already published in Turkish, but it is an abridged ver uh, version. Uh, so the parts, par <laughs> and particularly the parts I'm primarily working on, <laughs> is the ones that are abridged. So I'm following the uh, Greek text. In this book, uh, he used the patient records from the hospital, and he derived some calculations uh, about the uh, statics, statistics of these records and projected onto the urban context of the city himself. He already done a lot of data science uh, work by, like, manually. Uh, to analyze the diseases he had encountered in the hospital, uh, Paspartis studied the reasons behind the appearance of each illness, uh, such, such as the patient's working conditions, the urban context uh, uh, which they found uh, themselves in, and the relationship of, I mean, it, the relationship of illnesses and medicine uh, to their surroundings and the criticism of sordid and swampy areas of a city already was uh, being discussed in the 19th century European cities. So Paspatis was very uh, familiar with this uh, research already. Uh, and because of his studies in Europe, uh, his, particularly his medical studies in Europe. So in a similar way, he claimed that it was necessary uh, to investigate urban space uh, to understand the causes of illnesses and epidemics, and especially with regard to the lack of hygiene and poverty of the citizens, city's inhabitants. Accordingly, he devoted a separate chapter of the book uh, to analyzing the urban conditions of the city in that period. And looking from Paspartis' per perspective, which is in line with medical theories of the period, such as mi miasma theory, and based on the acceptance of the urban context and air as the primary source of illness, parallel analysis of the urban ground with the illnesses and occupations of the patients uh, has a potential, actually, to give us uh, clues about, uh, to give, actually, um, them uh, to uh, clues about how to solve the uh, illnesses. And from our perspective, of course, it gives us the, uh, to understand the urban ground and its relationship to illnesses, but also its relationship to uh, working spaces and how these people are uh, working in, this, in which uh, conditions, particularly the spaces of labor and the qualities uh, that resulted in the rise of certain illnesses. As I mentioned uh, in the book, Pasquatis utilized the statistical data he derived from the patient registers. Uh, these are certain examples from which was which were published in the book. Unfortunately, we don't have all of the statistical or all of the records here, which were kind of uh, around thirty six thousand uh, onto each patient. That if we had all this data, that would be another hum very humanistic project where we would actually co could combine with our uh, research on the <clears throat> on the census registers because this is also the period um, the records he is using is from eighteen thirty three up until eighteen sixty where. Would, which would really directly fit on, onto our uh, research on the census registers, uh, I assume. But unfortunately, as many things has uh, been erased or lost with the Greek history of Istanbul, these records also are like gone. So we, we only have what Paspatis has provided us, like short examples of those from the book. Um, again, another example of this sort of data. I mean, it's interesting, like how much detail he also. Uh, I mean, there were there was also recorded in these patient records about like one person. Uh, it's all, usually the background is recorded, like where they ca come from or they where uh, where are they part. If they are from the city of if, or if they are uh, immigrants from different uh, neighborhoods, different geographies of the empire. So or and their names, of course, but also their professions, as I mentioned, is of at most at most importance. But also uh, like what they had on their themselves, like in their pockets, etc. So it would be really an interesting and very valuable effort if we had all the data, which was like again uh, in passport. This is uh, counting. It's like six, thirty-six thousand six hundred something. So I mean, unfortunately, uh, we don't have it. But luckily, what we have is the derivations of Pasquat is already done, like a digital humanities in the 19th century, which was done by uh, not digital humanities, but a humanities research in uh, in the 19th century done by uh, the researcher himself. 
and uh, he again he has dri driven certain uh, out like so certain um, uh, results out of these statistical information he had in in hand. So he actually. Uh, grouped these people in terms of not only in terms of their professions but also their, in terms of their origins and he tried to understand like who is who has died more like what kind of illnesses resulted in more deaths but also which people are more subject to uh, more severe illnesses so he tried to relate all these uh, uh, the origins the uh, their space in the city and the professions they have and then their rate of illnesses to each other so he had correlated uh, like different sets of data uh, so this is the uh, this is the statistical part of it, uh, and at this point, I I really would like to underline and acknowledge uh, the support that I got from uh, one of our prominent uh, collaborators in our project as well, like my dear Murato Jamrat Kivanch from Kadiras University, because he he was more like intrigued by this. Uh, he was in my dissertation committee, and he was intrigued by this statistics when we talked about Pasquatis, and he uh, suggested me to work on this to pursue this research uh, actually. And uh, he was, he has also himself done a certain uh, statistical analysis on these data sets. But uh, I was more intrigued by the uh, textual side of it. Be, maybe being a historian, the textual part uh, intrigued me more about like how we can actually use and transform this into visualizations or into mappings. Like what, how can we visualize what Paspartis is saying us about Istanbul and about the labor spaces of Istanbul and the neighborhoods of, of Istanbul? Like what are the terms he's using? How can, how the, are these terms? translated into different languages because now we have at least two uh, versions of the book and then I'm also working on an English uh, translations of my own so I mean uh, that's also uh, challenging in many ways because uh, the translation of the words also uh, you know already a linguistic subject but I think it's also the conceptualization of the space like the underlining of uh, certain terms is also important like how he conceives certain uh, parts of the city and how he favors some of them and he disfavors the others and how does he relate it to the um illnesses actually and the plan is i mean <laughs> my ultimate goal is to map this my derivations from this textual analysis which would include this process of textual first analysis and then like first data text mining and then analysis and then uh, which would lead into a mapping project uh, which I'm trying to uh, conduct here at, at Berkeley, and I'm actually also trying to develop the skills, the necessary skills to be able to do that. So I'm following workshops on coding and uh, <laughs> text mining and everything like uh, through different uh, channels here. Um, yeah, this is about the, like this is my final words about uh, the um, Passportis project, and one last project I, th I think I can uh, mention. It's another uh, very, I think, a very more like in, a, in terms of scale, it's more uh, limited, but I think it also says a lot about what we understand from the life and intellectual life in the city. It's uh, the mapping, the map that we uh, provide, we had uh, pinned on the Google Maps, again, for, from the information we have derived from the uh, Stratis Tarinas' famous book, like Greek Press uh, in Istanbul. So these are actually the locations of um, the Greek uh, press offices, like the newspaper offices uh, in Istanbul. and. Um, you can find this in our website. It's already published uh, in Istanbul's website. Basically, it has the information about uh, each certain newspaper that were public that was published between 1850 and uh, 1950. And if you go to the map and like click one, uh, you can find the name of the uh, newspaper and then the date that uh, address was used because some newspapers changed addresses throughout time and uh, some newspapers like had more than one offices uh, in and around Pera, as you see in the first map. It is not only Pera, but it is different uh, parts of the like Jalol as well, as you would expect. But this shows us an intellectual uh, specialization of Greek uh, existence in the city as well. I mean, this is also another rereading or like recreating uh, the uh, existence of the Greek culture in the city. I think this is a uh, specialization of that knowledge as well. And then, of course, we have used uh, the historical certain historical maps to be able to find these addresses and locate them, which were like mostly uh, the ones I have consulted. Mostly were the ones like from early twentieth century, like the gold maps, etc. So I think uh, that might be the end of <laughs> at least. I mean, what I would like to say, um, Kristen, would you like to add something for the point that I made? Or I mean, Harris, do you have um, anything else? Otherwise. <laughs> 
Oh, well, we would actually, we put this last slide in because we, we do see ours, we're very open to new participants. If people are interested in getting involved in any of these projects or proposing others. Um, so we have our email address here and we would love to hear from you or anyone you know who might be interested in this. Um, did you want to talk about the neighborhood profiles at all? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I forgot okay. about this. <laughs> a different, I, I, yeah, different okay. leg of the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, the neighborhood profiles. Like, since, uh, yeah, Kristen mentioned already the Europe uh, students that we, are, we have been working for uh, since for a while, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, one year already. Uh, or uh, more than one semester at least. So there, are, um, I mean, initially in the project, we also wanted to develop certain, uh, once together and publicize and like uh, publicly uh, share the information we have about certain communities, certain neighborhoods in the city as well. So we also aim this uh, website to be part and parcel of this uh, information sharing and also attracting other people who doesn't have much knowledge about these uh, communities and neighborhoods. Uh, Etc. So the the um we we decided to develop certain profile uh, of each neighborhood and for the uh, Greek uh, particularly the Greek aspect of the, these uh, neighborhoods and uh, with the help of these students who were uh, also interested in the uh, in the research in, we are conducting in Istanbul, we have started working on certain neighborhoods and to draft uh, some neighborhood profiles from their perspective, which I think which I really find it is uh, important to have. Uh, I mean, it's not, of course, they are undergrads and it's not only uh, the uh, like scholarly art, uh, articles or like encyclopedia entries, which are already been repeated many times, but these are like fresh perspectives, what you would like to see about or what you would like to learn about uh, the Greek Arnautke or Greek uh, Fanari or Greek Veolu uh, from a fresh perspective, I would say. So we are working with uh, Europe students, the undergrads of history major in uh, Berkeley, and they are reading actually, and they are writing their own take uh, through these uh, sources, what uh, the, the sources that they can reach basically, of, of course, basically in English, but uh, they're drafting their own perspective on these uh, community profiles. And if I could just add, because I think this brings up a really important distinction we should be talking about, and I should have said earlier, is that as those of you who are Greek and, and know the Greek sources know there is a huge amount of a huge wealth of sources in the Greek language about these different neighborhoods and this very micro level. Um, but that knowledge does not get out <laughs> into English or into Turkish, obviously. And so that is the point. We could easily translate any number of articles, encyclopedia entries, et cetera, from Greek into English, but I don't think it would mean anything to the English speaking audience because they simply do not have the frame of reference to even understand, like there are a critical mass of people in the English speaking world that don't even understand that Greeks lived in Istanbul. Like it's, it's you have to start at such a basic level. So that is what we're trying to play with here with using these undergrads to kind of see how they understand when they're exposed to the rudiments of the story, what do they understand from it? And so it might mm -hmm. seem, if we put it on the website, it might look, you know, primitive or whatever, but it's, it's, that's part of the whole idea is this public humanities dimension and this public engagement. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that too. Yeah. yeah. Um, great, so um, I want to remind everyone that they can uh, write their questions in the chat section and that I will be reading them out to our speakers. But before that, I want to abuse my moderator's privileges and <laughs> ask some of my own questions, if I may. Uh, so. I'm, I'm going to play a bit the devil's advocate and say, you know, the typical uh, anti-digital humanities discourse. So, uh, yes, very nice pictures, but what do we <laughs> learn from those? And uh, I'm, I'm going to rephrase, of course, I'm, I'm saying this in jest, but uh, can you think of some particular uh, examples, issues where the finds uh, that you have come across already at this early stage um, went against conventional or uh, academic or popularized conventional wisdom on a particular uh, topic. I mean, one, one thing that I can think on top of my head is, you know, the myth of the myth of room uh, indogeneity, that, you know, the Greeks of Istanbul are descendants of the Byzantines. 
which is a very popular myth, but of course uh, not among an academic circles. But I, the, the one thing that instantly becomes evident from these files that you shared with us, from these the, both the Defters and the uh, Greek consulate archives, is that uh, um, the Rum community is actually a diasporic community in many ways, right? The, the, they come from different parts of the Ottoman Empire, sometimes even from the Habsburg Empire, right? Uh, and I don't know, can you think of other examples where you were like, wow, there you go. I, I wouldn't have thought of this through a, you know, qualitative analysis of the sources. Can you, can you guys think of anything? That's a, overall, that's a great question. And that's the reason I myself was always very skeptical of digital humanities, because it seemed like so much work to get to insights that we kind of already knew, right? Um, I have to say part of the draw, once you find a project that sort of captivates you, you get drawn in as a historian, you just get totally fascinated with the like, the fact that it's technologically possible now to just really get down to the irreducible <laughs> details and like reconstruct what it must have been like, you almost could like take a walk. That's what one of the projects we wanted to do and we may still do is like, for one of these deaf stars, we have one, I won't even it will remain anonymous, but one small Bosphorus neighborhood that it's literally every single person in the house and they went in a particular itinerary. And so like I got told like for months, I just got completely absorbed in like trying to like reconstruct the itinerary of the census taker and like take like imagine this kind of virtual tour through the thing. And I just think that even okay we do we have arrived at various insights that we didn't have before like you said the big one about the fact that this was not a static community and it was constantly flowing back and forth to other parts of the empire and and beyond um but even even in the absence of that we um it allows us to just understand differently the things that we thought we already knew um and I'm not going to say feel it, but it's almost, it's like, a, it's just a different kind of experience of the knowledge when you do it this way. Um, I guess for me, because I've worked a lot now on the Death Stars about 1821, and, and it's been very eye-opening to see the, and if you, we've even found some of the same people in the, some Death Stars from 1830, early 1830s, and to think about all of the changes that were happening and that there, you know, I remember there was one case when it was like a couple musicians in a Han <laughs> and they were there in 1821 and they were still there in 1831. So it's like, wow, <laughs> all of these things have been happening around them and these like massacres and this and that, and like, you know, the revolution and these guys are still surviving, playing their music. <laughs> They're just going on, right? So that, that's a small example, but like you just, you never know what you're going to stumble on when you get down to this level of detail, I guess. And actually Panos, I don't know if he's still here, but he has done some amazing work connecting up the specific people in the Ottoman death stairs with the same musicians in his Greek sources, which is, that's a whole different enterprise, way more laborious, right? We've just been looking at trying to almost quantify and visualize the one set of sources, but to go through painstakingly and actually find a person in the Ottoman death stare and then find information about that person in the Greek sources is also, I think, another pretty amazing thing you could do with these technologies. Yeah. Melike, did you have other? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put um, you on the yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually I was also thinking about like what I was thinking about uh the for instance I'm very much engaged with this uh Paspartes and Syllogos projects, which I you know uh, on Syllogos I have done some research uh, myself already in my dissertation about the intellectuals, their mind maps, their networks, their connections. And uh, the preliminary result that I have derived from there, which I have done through my like hands by reading or looking for names like manually. Uh, resulted being like saying already like this is actually way beyond than way beyond different than the syllogos we already know so it's not like the only greek the greek institution that is only aims the greek nationalism and the greek uh, student education and promoting greek of course this is there but it's not only it so there is way beyond and more participation than uh, we could assume uh, in in the syllogos already so but 
one person through reading all these by hand doesn't say, I mean, it says only through a limited perspective. So I said like, what if we read everything? Like what if we kind of uh, decipher everything and every single member and then what is the map it would, it would show us? Because as the community is evolving, Silagos is an institution that is evolving as well throughout time. It's like six, more than six decades. It's never the same institution uh, in the same decade. So um, already, yeah, the first engagement with the sources with this perspective already opens up like new uh, perspectives, like new questions and digital humanities tools, of course, make it uh, or hopefully will make it more easier or like more solid understanding of what is uh, really happening on the uh, on the ground. Uh, hopefully, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think we are already at the uh, at that point that we are, we are revising the knowledge that we know about these particular sources or particular like concepts that you have like mentioned uh, about these communities. So, yeah, I think we are there already. Wonderful. I can keep asking for hours, but I think I should give precedence mm -hmm. to our uh, uh, attendants, your, our guests. Um, so the first question is from um, uh, Mark McInnes who's uh, interested to hear about the fieldwork you did with the um, remaining community uh, in Istanbul. And uh, in particular, he asks how many individuals have you reached and is their memory significantly different from former Istanbul residents, uh, which I presume you would, you would have guessed from sources, right? But uh, um, yeah, yeah, this is an area where we definitely encourage other people have done it and are continuing to do it. And we would love to have like a section of the website where we feature that to to give, you know, to to use the hub function of this whole project. We ourselves haven't done systematic work there. Eli Urs, who was here attending, but I think she's tuned out now. She has written a whole book about this, about Istanbul Greeks in Athens. And I believe, is it Gönül Bozolu? There are a couple Turkish women who've done oral histories recently. One has done a film about um, the oral histories that she's taken, the interviews, and I feel like there's someone else too. So there are a few people working on this and we very much encourage it, but we decided, that's exactly why we decided to cut it off at 1923 because we couldn't do everything and we really wanted to focus on the 19th and early 20th centuries. But I think we can also mention uh, the uh, connections we have in Athens, like Savas, Savas Chilenis and uh, his his friends, like the Istanbul Greeks, Greek community of uh, Athens, who has actually like has an interest in the project. That's how uh, actually we have we uh, engaged into this who is who questionnaire and then to get yes. their information as well, like how they're actually remembering the families. They, I mean, their family ancest uh, ancestors, but also the knowledge they have on the communities yes. uh, from through their lived experience basically in, in Istanbul but of course again the focus as Chris mentioned again the focus our focus is more uh, on the uh, 19th century uh, actually yes yeah yeah I mean certainly they've been um, guides for us in thinking about this and we that's that was part of the project but we haven't systematically documented their mm -hmm. recollections mm -hmm. is the point yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, wonderful. The next question comes from Enver Ali Akova, an MA student in comparative literature at Koch. Uh, it's about the scope and the data of the network the project uh, is building on and whether it can be linked to a study of literary history. Uh, do you include or plan? Um, sorry, let me look at it better. Mm. So uh, do you also include or plan to extend the project to include networks of small-scale literary magazines like the Mechboaz or publishers of the Istanbul Room community or sub-communities in your data sets? If not, would such a map that fleshes out literary history that is not obscured by national narratives be within the scope of this humanist project? I think you I think you have an interested part here. Yeah, I was like, sure, <laughs> is that a proposal? Yeah. 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 yeah, please welcome and join us. <laughs> yeah, because I mean uh, I mean we need we basically need hands uh, for doing this because there are a lot to be done. Uh, there are a lot of yeah. sources. Of course, there can be these uh, journals like newspapers, there are Greek newspapers of Istanbul, there are journals, there are literary journals. I mean uh, the syllabus journal I'm working on is like just one thing, like there are many other uh, uh, like this, like printed in terms of printed material, there are books already. So uh, like Paspatit is again, like just one example. So there are hundreds of uh, other examples. So 
just we just need people who would like to collaborate on working on this because this uh, the data collection is uh, as Murat Hoca always says the data collection is the most part that uh, we need hands and people are required because yes. it is the most uh, in labor intensive uh, part of these data, uh, digital humanities projects so I mean why I just say why not we can definitely have a project on this if we have the uh, proposal and if we have the collaboration on that Wonderful. Another question is from uh, Roxana Coleman. Um, she's wondering if you have any plans or interests in uh, architecture. So creating a, a sort of database of architects, I presume, or buildings constructed by particular uh, room uh, architects in Istanbul. No, <laughs> yeah. Uh uh, I I shall begin with mentioning that uh, one of the like most knowledgeable experts on this topic, Savas Chilenis, is our like among our collaborators. Uh, we are glad to have him here in our group, and he's actually he has done already. He has published and done a, a lot about the uh, Greek architects of Istanbul, and they have made an exhibition and an ongoing projects uh, on particular uh, architects. And of course, our who is who questionnaire and like project larger project and also among the Silogos members. I mean, we are on different levels. We are touching upon this uh, topic of architecture and the architects of the period uh, as part of the ar uh, architectural community or part of the larger community of uh, Greeks in, in, in the city. Uh, not until not until now we have developed, I mean, other than what Savas is doing, we have not developed a new project on the architects particularly. But of course, me, myself, uh, studied architect we having studied architecture of course i'm very much interested in it and then once i finished the project why, uh, with paspartis why not about uh, architecture and i we have already some side projects i mean i have some other projects on the architecture of the greeks in the city uh, on the basically on the uh, fanariot communities of which Kristen is an mm. expert but now we are working on with another colleague uh, uh Naam Karkal from ted university on the uh, fanariot uh, of uh, fanariot architecture of the city. So, I mean, on the, as Kristen said, like this is a collaborative, and we are already continuing with our research, and it's in, uh, definitely uh, adding up to what we are doing in Istanbul as well. So, I think we are all together gathering this collaborative effort on uh, rereading of the history of Greeks in the city, and architecture yeah, is definitely are... the most significant part of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's it. The architecture was the originally part of the the plan, and and like Melike said, we've yeah. The more people power we have, the more we can do that. So that's definitely something we want to develop. Uh, wonderful. The next question is from uh, Orchun Jan, and uh, he is asking about why eighteen sixty is such a big uh, turning point in terms of the quality quantity of uh, data. Uh, he also notices that the 8059 is the date of the Paspatis book on Balutlivumas Tanisi data. So uh, if you can elaborate a bit on this, why is 1860 such a big uh, threshold, like a turning point? Yeah, great question. Um, Chris, is there you, yeah, well, I was gonna, well, there's, I mean, in the context of the Tanzimat and the Milet reforms, right, there is the establishment of this permanent mixed council, a national uh, mixed council. So there's like internal reorganization of the larger community. There is also a lot of longer term changes that are, that 1860 is sort of when the tide turns, like a sort of emergence of a more professional bourgeois class, right? There's like a middle class that's developing. There's, there's a lot of, um, legal, political, social, economic changes that kind of come together in the 1860s, I think. Also the kind of engagement from the Greek state um, in terms of, you know, not propagating, but sort of facilitating more publishing in Greek, I would assume is part of it, right? There is a cultural project to expand Greek um, kind of literary cultural production. Um, I'm sure there are other reasons as well, but printing presses, I'm not even sure. I haven't even looked into the specifics of whether there's like a proliferation at that point. Well, of course the press, right? That's from the 1860s on, it proliferates in the Ottoman and the Greek um, arenas. Uh, <laughs> So I don't think there's one specific answer, but if you guys have other elements to add, um, it really is, things really do shift dramatically at that point though. Yeah, I would definitely underline the importance of the press and printing uh, of these of these sources that increase the level of uh, publicity in many different levels, like the intellectual productions and everything. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I see that the 
uh, question also includes some uh, point about the past parties. I, uh, of course, the book uh, is more, uh, is the production of the pre-1860 period, but <laughs> because I feel like past parties is, is a more uh, 1860s, like, uh, but mm-hmm. he's, make, he's maybe one of the personas that has actually paved the way for the 1860s intellectual production and he has developed he has mm. one of the links from the earlier uh, knowledge on the city of like urban uh, ground from previous mm-hmm. centuries or pre- mm-hmm. previous periods into the 18 uh, into the 1860s that's why actually maybe he's one of the linking personas like between these two periods maybe he's not directly related to 1860s his mm-hmm. other work like Byzantine studies definitely belongs into that period but of course this book was produced in the uh like uh, before in uh, 1860s, like between 1830s and uh, 50s. Uh, but again, he's pretty much the uh, production or the, one of the producers of this same intellectual development of the mid 19th uh, century. So that's why uh, mm-hmm. he is part of it. Yeah. Yeah, and he's a, that's a great link actually because he was he is another eye onto the social reality pre eighteen sixty besides the Ottoman Deftars, right? So as you said, if only he'd given us like the specific names and the specifics of these patients, that would be incredible. We could just instantly do this incredible comparative. And I think but, his yeah. decision to move from a uh, practitioner in, of medicine, like with more contact with uh, people, daily people, like common public uh, in the city. To a more intellectual uh, level, also transforms like uh, also sh- shows us an indication of the transformation within the society within the city as well. But he's also uh, transforms the like translates the data into different realms. I mean, we would never uh, know about these people if he hadn't written about it. Like if he hadn't had, had the intellectual interest on these people. So that's also what's one significant key point about him, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, wonderful. There's uh, two questions by Dimitrios Kurtis. Uh, first, he says there has been a rising historiography of Ottoman international law and diplomacy, which quite strikingly disregards the presence, participation, and influence of the Rome community and its members. Do you think it is possible to connect these micro histories and rediscover the place, if any, of the Rome community and its members in the formation of Ottoman attitudes or policies towards the then prevailing international system? I and think that would be great. Yeah. Oh, sorry. There's a second one. I'll, 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 okay. I'll okay. try to spot it. Uh, do you believe that your da- data sets can be used, e.g., within the framework of memory studies? So these are the two oh. questions. Uh, I'm not totally sure what you mean by that one, but I do want to address the first one first. And that is... Um, Yes, I think, well, that if you're proposing, that would be an amazing project and we would sponsor, you know, we would like <laughs> feature that on our website and credit you if you wanted to pursue that further. I think some of the international law experts were room. I mean, obviously, Karateo Luri Pasha and every, they were like the major statesmen that must have been involved in discussions about international law. There were also Armenian experts in international law in the Ottoman realm. Um, and yeah, I think that would be amazing to link them up. I mean, I, in a sense, I, that's what I tried to do in my first book on the earlier period. And I think it's waiting to be done for that later period to really integrate the meaning of, you know, the fact that all of these statesmen and, and political experts were room with the direction that the empire was taking and the kinds of understandings of, of international law and how the empire connected to the other, to other regions. Yeah. So I, Yes. Um, and I don't know, if memory studies, do you mean what linking, uh, like comparing current memory with the data that we find? Is that? I wish we I, could I, Yes, M- maybe, yeah. maybe we can <laughs> Let's get Let's assume. A, yes, maybe oral history yes, if, project. If that's, I mean, that is exactly why I think it would be great to, to compare and to, um, And that is why as much as I totally appreciate oral history and I'm skeptical as a historian, I, we all know that that doesn't necessarily mean that the way people recollect the past is the way that it was, or the evidence might not bear out exactly the same details that they remember. And that's, that's to me, what's interesting about memory studies is what kind of gets changed and morphed in the process. Yeah. 
So uh, we have quite a few more questions and we're uh, moving towards the end of the talk. Uh, but uh, there's one question that I think we can leave for the end because uh, it's, you, I presume you're going to talk a lot about this, which is the Filiketeria project, which is uh, fascinating by itself. Uh, Paul Karas is asking, how is it, is a mapping project going on? Yeah, and, uh, he has a vested maybe, interest. <laughs> yes, maybe we can we can close with that. Before, before we talk about your Filiketeria project, there's one more question uh, from uh, Eric Larden uh, concerning uh, the neighborhood level. And uh, uh, do you think that the information you can get uh, says a lot about street life in 19th century Mahales? Does it imply some form of cosmopolitan coexistence, separation, or a mix of the two? And were communities were more or less clustered around churches or more dispersed and intermingled with others? Any surprises or confirmations of previous assumptions? I think we're years out from being able to answer those questions because <laughs> we're because um, <laughs> we're really we're going deft we're going register by register and we're doing these specific uh, kind of visualizations and reconstructions. And in order to get to that level of generalization, I think it's going to take way more effort that we are mm -hmm. hoping to get there at some point to kind of um, refine or revise our understanding of how these multi-confessional cities and neighborhoods worked. But um, but I would reserve generalization for now. <laughs> we need to finish all these left us first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, one more question. We do find though, I have to ah, sorry. Anyway, one thing we do find, at least in the earlier deaf stars, which I think is interesting, is the areas of settlement, like in the old city, and again, maybe this is obvious, but the areas of settlement in the old city are often, well, you can see the <clears throat> inferior status, I suppose, of the room communities in where they were relegated to settle, like near mm -hmm. the slaughterhouses, near the, you know, like near the cemeteries, near, you know, you can, you can definitely see the hierarchy in the geography of the city in that sense. Um, and that is something that, again, perhaps it was obvious, but it was interesting to see it just right, you know, in front of my face when I tried to plot out where these things were located. No, and, and I guess there's always an interesting chicken question, uh, chicken and the egg question about the places of worship, right? Did the neighbor, does the neighborhood develop around the place of worship? Or yeah. does the place of worship appear later on in an already developed uh, neighborhood that has large number of rooms or Jews or Armenians who request yeah. it, right? And that's, yeah. I think that's uh, every individual case is an individual case. Like it changes from uh, neighborhood to neighborhood. Uh, Gyokan, yeah. our friend Gyokan asks us if uh, there's a difference in data acquisition post 1908. <laughs> so if the, uh, the Young Turks uh, period is visible in any way in the data you have examined? Uh, that's a we haven't systematically worked on that later period yet, mm -hmm. but I know that there is like in Anthemio and there's tons and and there's um and in the or in the community archives there's tons from this later period um and there there is a, there are censuses that the patriarch had to do and the Armenian patriarch too there were I think it was was it 1907. Or 19, mm -hmm. there were, it was, yeah. And so that um, that has been done on the Armenian side, again, by the Daniel Ohanyan and Erdem Kabadaya one. They've like um, done data sets out of those. And we have the Greek, I think we have the Greek equivalent to do that. We just haven't, again, if, you, if anyone wants to take that on, that would be amazing because we've been so busy working on the earlier period. We just haven't gotten there, but that would be a really interesting question. Um, I don't, I don't know. It'd be interesting to know what the census policies were. I, I don't, I think the whole point was there weren't a ton of censuses in that later period. And that's what all the discussions were regarding the population exchange about who was, you know, the etabli, right? Who, at what point was it was marked. And I think probably some of the people here, the room here might be able, uh, attending here might be able to tell us, but it was about a particular census. If you were resident in Istanbul as of a particular Nine, census. Which 1918, was, I think. Oh, it was 18. So they did one in 18. Prior to yeah. 1918. So that would be. So there must have been a census in 1918. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that, yeah, clearly this is still um, uncovered ground for us, but we, it's definitely relevant to what we're doing in terms of following through to the later part of the period. Uh, Melike, would you like to add something or? Oh, what I would add again, <laughs> I'm too much involved into the Silagos thing, but uh, I can say like <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the Silagos disappears on of, after certain, like after 1912, basically, because their publications are, they're unable to publish for various reasons. Uh, so we don't have their publications very like su supplement kind of uh, additional work continues after 1912, uh, but they actually stop. Uh, of course, there are certain mm -hmm. leaflets that were published much later about the 1920s of uh, the Silogos, which informs us about the activities. But it is basically uh, around this period that they were uh, like the intellectuals were more engaged in different topics than uh, intellectual research, maybe. So they were not unable to publish, continue this journal. So yeah, there is an impact for sure, maybe in at least in that level. Uh, but I, I haven't been, of course, uh, also I'm not, uh, I haven't studied that period that deeply uh, as Kristen said, like we are not, uh, we, don't, we don't cover that period yet that in mm -hmm. detail. So if someone wants to cover within the project, <laughs> that's more than welcome. Yeah. So the Filiki Eteria project, any, any updates? <laughs> Okay, so that okay. <laughs> that was a <clears throat> maybe a very short introduction as to what the Filiketeria is, because maybe some of some of the attendants. Uh, okay, not... so Filiketeria Society of Friends, the secret society, um, <clears throat> established in Odessa in 1815, 16 by some merchants that became the um, it became the the organization that kind of organized and launched the Greek revolution, right? Um, and so I was interested in, and from a geographic perspective, and there is another data project that has happened, it just hasn't been published and we're, we're, we're going to be working with them to share data and expand what we've done. Um, but I wanted to track where these people were and then correlate it with the subscriber list in 1819, book that I talk about in my first book um, that and a couple other sources that we had to sort of get a sense of how Istanbul, how the Istanbul networks fit in with the larger kind of network that hatched the Greek revolution. And if there was, if it was two distinct um, worlds or if there, you know, what kinds of overlap there, there was going to be. So it's, and I thought from a data perspective, they're small and manageable data sets that we could sort of, um, use as pilot projects to develop the tools. And we got quite far. And I guess, I mean, where did, did we get stuck? I'm not sure if we got stuck. We just like got it to a certain point and put it on hold for a while. Uh, Actually, we got muted. stuck. We, yeah, sorry. I uh, I think we are stuck uh, at the level of uh, visualizing things like in terms of data collecting, yeah. we are not stuck. <laughs> in historians' tests, yes. we are, we are good. Yeah, we're good, of, A plus. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But in terms of digital, uh, let's say data, like data conversions, uh, we are t learning mm -hmm. our ways and we are trying to collaborate people uh, in these. And this is another difficulty that we are uh, encountering in the field because like people we are working and collaborating in terms of IT, uh, they usually unable to read Turkish or Greek. So uh, that's why, <laughs> that's yeah. particularly the reason that I'm devoting this time onto this learning these technologies so that at least to be able to speak like in both languages in, in a different level. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is actually the, where we're stuck. So yeah, uh, and we do have a team that's working, like they're supposed to be rolling out in the next month or two, the mm -hmm. tools to be able to follow through with the visualization. So we have a lot of data sets kind of ready to, to launch. Um, so stay with us, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Stay in touch. <laughs> yeah, and he was also he has also participated uh, to this yes. Filiketria project. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I have a final question, if I may. Uh, I mean, volunt vol volunteers is an amazing thing. It really pushes projects like this forwards. But have you considered uh, any further steps towards expanding and, of course, funding? So. Uh, <laughs> Um, um, would you, or is it, is this something that you would like to keep, uh, sort of, uh, interpret this like John Lewis, you know, like from the heart? Uh, well, but, that is, uh, yeah, that has been one of the virtues I think of it is that we've, we've done it. I, I decided not to focus a lot on applying for big, huge grants or anything like that. So, um, 
we will operate with the resources we have. And if, if we get more resources that we can do a lot more, um, the dream is to kind of set up a separate little institute or organization and we could sponsor a ton. We could generate a huge amount of knowledge with resources. So I guess that's an open plea to the universe. <laughs> But yeah, so far it's we've focused on community building and just the excitement of it actually, because it is even two years in, I, I find it a very exciting project. Um, and I couldn't have done it without Mary Kay, who's sort of become the kind of uh, executive director of the whole thing and has really um, been extremely persistent and conscientious and hardworking about working with our Thank volunteers you. and kind of managing all the different projects. So. Very yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's a pleasure that uh, we are collaborating on this because I also believe in my heart, like the value and the importance of this project. And also, working with volunteers is also another uh, important aspect of it because th th then you meet with new people and new ideas about the topics that you are already been working for a while, and it refreshes you. And then uh, to learn about their perspective also helps you uh, a lot. So more volunteers, we would be more interested in doing this as well. But I should also acknowledge, like, again, once again, uh, Tibitak for ha having me here, like, uh, at Berkeley, because this is how we could get uh, more close contact with Christine and, like, we could work on this topic more uh, closely. And hopefully this year will be that year. So, yeah, mm -hmm. once again, I should mention. Wonderful. We've, we've run out of time, unfortunately. It was a pleasure talking with you and uh, thank you for the presentation. Congratulations, good luck with the next steps. I'm sure there'll be many. And thank, thank, you. Uh, thank you to all the participants as well, the people who listened and uh, participated, asked questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hardy, and thank you, Iran. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you. And I would like to thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Also, thank to the listeners for the questions and contributions. Uh, good evening to all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.